Thank you for tuning in to the Starkey Multifamily Podcast. Uh, we're back after a little bit of a break here. So I brought on uh, Hendra, who has just completed a loan assumption. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to bring that on is, is uh, I had some personal struggles on a loan assumption uh, where we were not able to get past uh, some of the hurdles on the loan assumption. So Hendra, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and let's get it started. Yeah, so... Um... You know, I'm, I'm a multifamily syndicator. You know, that's my side hustle. I, I would have to say that the, my side hustle because I still have a W2 job. You know, I practically, you can say that I have two, two, two full-time job in this case, right? Multifamily and as well as my technology consultant. That's what I do. Well, again, thanks for coming on. Let's talk about, let's jump right into the, the loan assumption deal. Um, you know, how, how big is it? Where is it at? And, you know, give us the details for the deal. Yeah, so this one is coming off market. It's a 68 units in Kansas, in the suburb of Wichita. And pretty much coming from, to us on the table because uh, the seller is actually a, a fund that's trying to, they, they predominantly the fund was originally um, focusing more on the life tech product, low income housing tax credit, but they start shifting their portfolio focus into more the development, brand new development. So this is the last two assets they're trying to dispose and it came across our table. Uh, when we look into it, it's just pretty, the number makes sense. Uh, I think they were asking for 4.2, 68 units. The median area um, income in the area is actually about 70,000. So which is the number is really, really making good sense. But the caveat is it's a loan assumption. Now um, it's a, with Penny and it comes with the yield maintenance. Um, so for those who doesn't know, yield maintenance is just like a number, like a formula that you have to calculate. It's like a prepayment penalty, but it's just very co complex formula that we're going to take it as is, then we got to pay about $700,000 penalty that the seller is not willing to incur. So we're going to be pass it to us as a buyer, which if we adding those in, the number literally putting us upside down. So we got to structure in a way, you know, through loan assumption, um, working with the lender and the buyer, I mean the seller, we as a buyer too, working hand in hand. And it's quite a lengthy process though. I'll, I'll be honest, it's not for what people have to explain apart because it took us almost eight months just to get it close. Yeah, it, there's there's a lot to loan assumptions that, uh, you know, I, I don't think many people are aware of, so that's going to be good. So uh, you said this was a Fannie deal. Did I hear you right? Correct, yep. Yeah. Okay, and so what were the terms on that, if, if you can get into the terms of the loan? So the, the loan itself, uh, it's straight uh, p &I. There's no interest only. It's, uh, the interest rate is a little bit on the higher side. I mean, given the market condition today, it's at the four, four and a quarter. So it's on the high side, obviously. It's an, uh, so for a lot of people that are taking a loan assumption um, route, they're probably going to think this is just like, it doesn't make any sense at all. Right, because number number one, you gotta assume the loan, so you have to come up with the the difference between the loan balance and the purchase price. Mm -hmm. I think the loan balance was like about two point six something. So you have to come up with at least you know one point five uh, to begin with cash, right? Uh, the difference, and then plus the interest rate is also on the high side too for point a quarter. Given that everybody else like usually in the high threes or mid threes, uh, you know, depending on the time, you know, the timing of your loan. So those are the two caveats that turn people down um, because of the loan assumption. Well, so, I mean, uh, on the surface, if you're able to get the returns, um, you know, with such a, with a low leverage, so I don't know, what was your overall leverage percentage on that? I have to look it up to get a number though, to be honest though, I, I don't remember the top of my head in there. Okay, well, that's fine. So yeah, the, uh, the advantage of that is the, you know, the having the low leverage, if you're still able to get the returns, you know, uh, that's that's pretty good because there obviously the more leverage you have, the well, riskier the deal becomes. If you're very under leveraged uh, and still getting returns, that, that makes it a really uh, spectacular deal. So were you able to get pretty good est or expected returns on that? Yeah. So I think for our uh, overall, we're averaging about twelve to thirteen percent annual cash and cash turn because a lot of things. Um, the loan assumption works when the property is already stabilized. There's almost no value add component to be added, which is in mm -hmm. this case, 
the, the property is. Because a lot of time people coming with the mindset of like, oh, I want to do value add value and I want to do adding more capex, um, heavy capex, heavy value add. Um, and that's where the number is going to be turning up, upside down and the number, number doesn't make any sense. So mm -hmm. in this case here, we it is a 99 uh, product, which is pretty recent. Uh, compared to like 60s or 70s product that we've seen in the market typically. And also, uh, historically, the occupancy is pretty stable. It, it's in the mid 90s. So it's very stable product and, and a very good uh, high income area. So that kind of help make the number, you know, make sense. Yeah. So, so we got a, we find the deal. We've got uh, a you know, good, good return. You've got good terms which uh, four and a quarter is still historically uh, good terms, by the way. So tell me about the, the assumption process. So who did you have to go through? What were some of the struggles? So where did, like, who did you reach out first? Uh, let's start with there. Who, who did you reach out to first to start that process? So we, we work with this servicer for Fannie Mae. In this case, it's Arbor, a company called Arbor. They're the, the, the brokerage firm as servicing this business. So, so we got to work with them, understanding so it's pretty interesting, like, and very unlike the typical multifamily transaction where you typically work with the seller and buyer and then lender typically come in after, right? Before that transaction will typically happen, you might have some relationship with your lender to begin with. So you have a pretty good, strong relationship. In this case here, lender obviously have to party, uh, you know, it's like dance together with the buyer and us, you know, and the seller, right? So make sure that they just want to make sure that the asset, which is the property that we're acquiring, going to be still performing at the um, state that they're expecting to be uh, from the seller perspective. And also they want to vet it out that we are as a buyer, we also have the credential experience and the qualification still to be able at least maintain the property per their requests or the, per their standard in this case. So we reach out to them get understanding and then from there um obviously there's like a sort of like a list like a procedure that you need to do you know before before um, you can assume the loan just like that number one um your qualification your resume like i said and then number two uh, they also want to see how the asset performing um especially like the, the t30 t60 t9 days they want to see the performance of the last 30 days 90 days 60 days it's just only training up Right, at least in the consistent basis. So that's what been the, the struggle, the challenge typically, because um, one of the struggle that we have when the moment that we have under contract, the, the onsite property managers actually quit. Now, the salary happened in the, in the tough situation, like, do I really want to bring somebody else in is for temporary basis, given that the onsite, the onsite property managers really can helping up to maintaining the the quality of the asset, but the property manager that they, they have, the independent ones actually located about three hours away. So that kind of adding more complexity in some of like maintaining the, the stability of the product, uh, the, our, the property in that time. So that's what has been the, the, the biggest struggle for us, how to maintain the level of the performance for the, for the property. Yeah, so not only you know are they vetting you, but they're vetting their the properties that they've already got leveraged. What do you think your take is on on that? So if the property was underperforming, you know, let's say and not in this case, but it was the seller's fault, you know, what why you would think they would be looking for somebody to take it over and, and do something different with it as opposed to the same one? Well, I mean. Obviously, you gotta you gotta find out what's the the motivation of the seller to begin with if that if that's ever happened, right? Um, you know, obviously, you gotta be a little bit more challenging to assume the loan that way if that's really ever the case, because from the lender perspective, um, you and I know for, for properties actually the only collateral they have right now if it's only less performing. Uh, is less than stellar, then obviously you're going to be a problematic for, for, for you to assume the loan right. right? or even to get rid of it to begin with. So the only way you can do is just basically monitoring it and work together with the, with the seller, right? The lender in, in this case here, make sure that there is maintained before somebody can take over from there. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, an interesting perspective. So um, how difficult was it for the the vetting process of you and your team? What what things did they look for? What questions did they ask? It's pretty pretty straightforward, though. I mean, obviously, if you're you don't really have any anyone that ever dealt with um, you know agency debt before, agency lender. So that's something that they're looking for. Like, hey, anybody have an experience with the agency lender or any agency loan? That's going to be pretty key. So if you don't have any in your team, then obviously you want to bring another one as a as a KP or GP and help you out. Uh, liquidity is another one, obviously, right? Somebody can have the network and the liquidity uh, to sign on the loan, even though uh, it's an on-recourse, but still, at the end of the day, you know, being someone that, hey, somebody can, within your team or the the, the GP team, they can be step in if there's anything happening that needs to be done to correct course the, the property situation. You said it took you about eight months to, to do the assumption process. So... Um, so those things are all uh, pretty standard in any agency debt, even new agency debt. Um, so what what was it that took the time? What processes were, did you have to go through? Um, what was the, the waiting period? What was all involved in that? So the biggest one is actually, like I said, uh, the performance drop. Because when we underwrote it, the property was occupied about 94%, which is pretty nice. But the moment we draw, uh, we we do physical inspection. The day after, the onsite property manager or leasing agent, I, was, I should say, um, she quit, right? And then obviously that impacting, you know, the incoming um, food traffic who's looking for. Uh, we we got some vacant property obviously during that time, but with nobody without anybody following up or returning the call, then the space will never get filled out. So it, it going went downhill since then. It won't, at one point it went downhill to 89%. So we literally have to have a joint uh, call with the seller and the lender. And so the lender has to say like, look guys, this is what's happening. So we cannot never really close um, until you really bring up the, you know, the performance of property back up again, you know, at least to 95%. So that's when the, the seller come to a realization that, hey, this is getting serious. You know, we, I mean, it's a good thing that we got a motivated seller too because of their, they're trying to dispose this property for a reason of their fund is being shipped to different, uh, different focus. So it really helped us to work together with them. Like, hey, what can we do to work together to get this transaction close? So as long as you got both party that have an really interest to get it, the deal moving and close, I think that's a good partnership to get the loan assumption to be working too. So what um, what was your biggest challenge in the process? What was the, the hardest part to get past besides the the occupancy there? Boy, I, I would I would say that uh, you know I feel like uh, this is like more an endurance, <laughs> like because you you know there's a day that you wake up you feel like yep you're really pumped like yep I'm gonna get this deal moving and then close you know pretty soon and then you know in a couple of weeks and a couple of weeks went by and then you just realize like what it just happened and you just feel like you you it's like you know kicking yourself, you know, it's like, what's going on? You know, I thought that we, we did what we need to do. And then I think the the mindset of, of like an endurance uh, runner need to become in place. Like, you know, you really have a mental toughness because the deal, like I said, for eight months, that that's, you know, that's going to be constant up and down mood swing, right? Because there are things that are promising and then one thing or the other, they, the the lender find out something that they have to delay it, or maybe the title said, hey, wait a minute, what about this one? And then you got prolonged decision. That's what been the struggle. I mean, it's not just like everybody happy and everybody agree, and then we can just sign the paper and everybody everything's going to be fine. Yeah. So there still um, are some fees associated with um, with assuming the loan. What was what were the fees on that one? Fees is just 1% of the loan balance, though. So it's just pretty normal, just like um, new new loan still. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, so that was uh, obviously much much cheaper than the, what, 700,000 for breaking the letter for prepayment. Basically. Yeah, yeah the, the, the yield maintenance, that's correct. Yes, I mean, because it, it's a thing, right? Another thing is also because yield maintenance, the way we, we look in and during last year, even apply today, that we need to have like COVID reserve, right? So we're if we're gonna not only just pay seven hundred thousand, but you have to come up with like what to nine to twelve months um, 
reserve for COVID that you have to come on the top of that. So 700,000 is uh, pretty much you lo loss, right? And then nine to 12 months uh, reserve, that's something you need to raise as a syndicator that you have to pay interest to. So as you can imagine, that's gonna be pretty hefty amount, you know, that you, you have to raise and then you have to pay interest. And then the number doesn't make any sense to go that route also. So with a loan assumption, um, you don't have to come up with the uh, reserve, the COVID reserve, at least for the time being, right? Which worked yeah. out really well too. Well, that yeah, that can make a big difference, you know, with with the amount of raise. And you already had a, a substantial raise, uh, you know, to to make that happen anyway. So let's, let's talk about that. How how did the raise go? How um, how difficult was that? To, was this your how how many deals have you done before this? This is my my fourth deals coming in as a GP. The race is quite challenging, not for the reason of raising the capital, just you know, trying to stay in communication with the with your investor, right? Because you 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 have a great product, you have a great project, but at the end of the day, can they stay in with you throughout the eight months period? We have mm -hmm. to constantly remind them like, hey, you know, um, we got a great product, you know, why we, we like this product, why we like this project. And then people said, yep, sign me up. And some people even, you know, even already wired their, their money. And then we have to be constantly, you know, explain to them why, what's the delay. And, and that's always been the, the challenging portion of it. It's because uh, the fact that people start asking, like, are we, are we ever going to be closing this deal? You know? So we, we got to be constantly communicating, educating them. Like this is a loan assumption process, not us that doesn't want to do it. It's not about the lender. It's just unfortunate situation that we have to go through with the lender and trying to make it work, you know, and, and also fulfill what they're looking for. Yeah, that, um, so that's a difficult part that you mentioned. So you get somebody at the beginning of that eight months process and you have them invest, we'll say a hundred thousand and they put that money in their return on investment doesn't start until the close date. Um, and, yep. and they can certainly get kind of antsy when uh, closing gets pushed back or, or things like that can happen. So how do you, how do you deal with somebody that, that puts their money in on, you know, day one and, you know, eight months later, they're getting anxious, anxious because their money's making zero uh, at that point. Um, so how, yep. how do you handle that? So, we are being in communication all the time, being on the top of communication is pretty key, all right? Because the moment that we do the, the webinar, uh, a Zoom call, jump in, we explain about the timeline. Well, we also be aware that, hey, until we are certain, we're not gonna ask you to wire your fund. I mean, we, we ask them to soft commit typically first, and then be constantly in communicating with them. Hey, you know, this is where we are. I think that's pretty key, right? If you have a good relationship, and they trust you, right? That's how you return the favor back by keep educating them of the overall circumstances. If you believe in the project, if you uh, and then and they're also trusting you and trusting the project, then it's gonna be easier to communicate it back uh, what's the hold up. Now, obviously, there's gonna be a day and time that you know you gotta do uh, above and beyond in explaining it. Uh, but I think you, if you paint the picture really well and give them the understanding like, hey, it's not us that trying to hold it up, you know, um, to, from closing just because of, you know, one small little th thing that uh, we have to bring on the table and then explain it to the uh, lender or even the buy, uh, seller is asking for something or, or missing part from the seller. We have to be able to communicate back again to, the, to our investor. Yeah. So yeah, that's definitely an obstacle to overcome. So, um, so but you did, you got it closed, you raised the money. And then, so how, what was the uh, game plan moving forward? So how many years left are on the loan that you assumed? We got about six years. So the plan right now, uh, right now the property is actually uh, the end of this month, we're going to be 100% full, uh, filled mm -hmm. up. Uh, we got a... It's in a great condition though. Uh, almost no uh, different maintenance had to be done, except a few little things like, you know, like a, we, got, we got like a picnic bench that needs to be updated, sign, you know, um, we're gonna put the dog park and and start adding some, 
you know, small, small amenities like the, you know, uh, carport, um, that we're gonna have helping, you know, people over there because, you know, in, in Kansas and Midwest typically, right? They're very high wind and they're very prone to hail. I mean, you live in Midwest, you, you, you're familiar with all the high winds and especially tornado alley in Kansas and, and also the blizzard and scorching heat, right? So we're gonna put some um, carport to help them and obviously gonna be uh, additional income for us um, and just going to be maintaining it that way. Uh, I think there's room to grow also uh, in terms of the properties to uh, rent. We are about 100 to 100, $110 below market rent. So right now with the moment that we took over when we put a property manager over there, we got at least eight phone call every day on a daily basis. So that's the number of foot traffic that we got. Even if we haven't done any marketing at all. That's how solid the, the property is actually. But just without somebody on site that kind of, you know, make it worse situation, you know, six months or eight, seven months ago. Yeah, well, that's uh, not a really a good opportunity. It's supposed to be in that much lower. So you still have some value add to add to this. Um, uh, yeah, so not so much high value add, but not heavy value add, I would say, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, $100 a month is pretty good. So we're talking maybe uh, adding CapEx to a value add or just raising rent as a value add, right? Yep, right. yep correct. So there's not really much CapEx needed. They're just not charging enough rent. Yeah. Correct, that's correct, yep. Yeah, those are those are real nice when you don't have to invest. So a lot of people uh, um, overlook the cost of raising rent sometimes. So they'll look at uh, maybe a place that is maybe a hundred dollars under market for a reason. You know, they're they're much out, much more outdated than its competition. Maybe there's uh, some amenities missing at that place compared to another. Um, and they, you know, they they undervalue, they, they think they can just go raise the rent because everybody else is that way. But, um, you know, sometimes yeah. there's an expense to getting there. So it's nice to not have that CapEx and just have that, that room to grow. What's the exit plan at six years? So the exit plan um, right now, we're just probably gonna gonna sell it, and then if there's an opportunity for us to refi and, and cash out and pay back, possibility we, we might entertain that one. Um, but right now, six years, hold it, let it ride, uh, uh, increase the uh, property valuation, and just sell it. That's always the main goal, and return the money back to the investor. But it's just an opportunity for us to refi and, and cash out. We don't know. I mean, that's also going to be an option on the table also. Yeah. Well, who knows if, if inflation goes where, where I think it might, uh, there might be quite a bit of cash out at, at the end of that six years. So that's what we're hoping for, right? Everybody else yeah. <laughs> too. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It could, uh, it could get interesting here and to see what, what happens in the next few years in, in multifamily. So um, very excited Absolutely. about that. Um, so that's a good segue to um, you are in charge of the San Francisco multifamily and more. Am I correct? That's correct. Yep. So I actually am friends with uh, Jamie Gruber, who does the Michigan multifamily and more. Um, so tell us a little bit about the group. Uh, what benefits does it have to our, our listeners, and um, you know what what should they where should they go to to be a part of that group? Yeah, so if you are interested to learn more, you can go to our Facebook group, San Francisco Chapter of Multifamily and more. Um, it's basically a platform where people get educated. We have a host uh, hosting a monthly meetup, virtual meetup, uh, you know, the past uh, 12 months now. Uh, we, we brought in uh, people uh, like Bob Burke, the go-giver author. So I, because I'm, I'm, we are a firm believer that Investing in multifamily is not just only knowing, uh, what, you know, knowledge, but it's also about mindset and it's all about an attitude, right? Um, you know, uh, so that's the reason we brought in Bob Burke earlier this year, um, because we, we need to learn as a go giver, like you know, how we add value to each other, and that's how we, we grow right, as a multifamily investor. And also the the platform is used not only just for uh, monthly mixer, monthly meetup, getting educated but also a platform for connecting. Um, I know that in San Francisco, obviously there's no multifamily deals, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that might be interested in getting into multifamily, 
but they maybe have a capital or maybe have the technology they can also by adding value and partner up with people that may be boots on the ground, uh, you know. So that's how I grow my, you know, my multifamily portfolio. I usually work with people that do some boots on the ground. I lived in San Francisco Bay Area, never invested here uh, for many reasons, um, but we always network and find deals somewhere else, you know, deal in Kansas, deal in Dallas, in Kentucky, just because through networking. And then how can we, you know, learn how to add value to the partnership and the team and grow together? Yeah, and I, I've said it many times before, but I, I agree with you that the value in investing in multifamily, at least mid to large multifamily, is that most people cannot do this by themselves. And, and I might, some might argue that nobody can, but I'm sure there's some exceptions. But um, you need people and you need connections. You need you need to have a connection with a lender. You need to have, um, you know, the right people on your team, the uh, management. This is not something you can just go do yourself like some people do on single family or smaller or multifamily. Um, so having those connections and building them before you get into this and through your career, um, you know, is, is very important. So I, I agree the value that you add in the multifamily and more group, which is, is getting quite large. So I haven't, really talk to Jamie's very much. He's been pretty busy lately, but um, you got uh, how many different chapters now? Do you know? I think it's like 30 or 31. And then I know that he interviewed uh, at least a bunch more. So we're going to add in more, more chapters though. Who knows why? I mean, you know, um, 18 months ago, I think we, we were the ninth chapter now, which is pretty fascinating. We're, you know, growing, you know, more than 30 chapters now. Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty spectacular. So that's got to be a sign to something that you are all doing correctly and, and bringing a, a lot of value to people. So I appreciate you doing that for, for the community. So, uh, so Hendra, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, how can somebody get a hold of you uh, if they'd like to reach out? So they can get a hold of me by um, connecting through Facebook, uh, Hendra Tambuna, Facebook or um, they can also join the San Francisco Multifamily and More Facebook group. Uh, and alternately, they can also check my, uh, our website, Idea Box Capital, I-D-E-A-B-O-X Capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L dot com. Um, you know, and it's a contact us, feel free to, to put in there. You know, I'm happy to help anyone who's gonna wanna grow into their multifamily or even venturing to a multifamily for the first time, you know, you and I are at one point rate we are, we start somewhere if somebody mm -hmm. invested their their time and knowledge that you know with us and then you know to take us where we are so I want to do paid for it also to anyone that want to learn about multifamily and, and help them along the way yeah wonderful well uh, I certainly appreciate it that's a, a wonderful offer for you so um all right well thank you very much and uh, and I appreciate your time yep thank you thank, thank you for having me